वेलकम गर्ल्स सो दिस इज अ डिरेक्ट कंटिन्यूएशन ऑफ द लास्ट क्लास दैट वी हैड टुगेदर यू कैन सी ऑन द वाइट बोर्ड वट एवर आई वॉज टीचिंग इन द लास्ट क्लास यू कैन सी हैव अ ग्लिम्स ऑफ दैट ओवर हियर इन द वाइट बोर्ड सो वी वर बेसिकली टॉकिंग अबाउट द कैरेक्टर्स एंड हाउ दे are part of each other and form a whole uh, of each other and satisfy the parts that make that whole as well so we were talking about teddy and uh, as you can see it's written on the white board that uh, this is how he tries to negotiate with the condition or with the situation that he is at home uh the fact that he tries to attain and retain an intellectual equilibrium uh is a way of his escape or is the way in which he survives this chaos represented on the stage the internal chaos that is represented on the stage uh and uh, he is as i concluded in the last class that he is the exact antithesis of his youngest brother that is joy as joy is the physical self teddy is the observing uh, intellect but however teddy protests however much teddy protests that he won't be lost uh, in it if you remember the quotation so this is uh, the quote uh, this is the extract from which i had quoted previously you can see on the screen uh, the fact that he says however much he says that he won't be lost in it the last line with which the speech ended uh, the last line however much he says that says this rather he is inevitably connected with joy's world of passion his joy's world of physicality and the connecting link is lenny so we move on to the third in the group the connection is lenny lenny is the connection between teddy who is the intellectual part of the self intellectual side of the self and joy the physical side of the self and lenny comes as the modest among the two so he becomes the bridge between the two the middle brother he is in his early 30s teddy is in the middle 30s and joy is in the middle 20s that is so the way that lenny handles or deals with uh, teddy and joy remember the names do not confuse the names so so the way in which lenny negotiates or handles the two brothers joy and teddy that is there is a consistency in his character we can see we can find a consistency in his character pinter sustains that consistency in his character and lenny essentially has this double sense of existence we all have this double sense of existence we are all we all face a certain moment in life in which we have to choose uh between the age old battle between the mind and the intellect and the passion uh and philosophically in the history of philosophy there have been sides people have taken sides of one and the other people have said that one is superior to other but what pinto tries to show over here is that there are both the both sides in each and every human being and lenny represents the amalgamation the coexistence of these sides we accept them we accept these two we accept these two as the two sides of the coin of the of existence both allegorical that is sim- in the simplest sense one is the mind and the other is the body and the problem is the confusion is that they are each fully realized characters in the play in lenny we find no such 
dualities. In Lenny, we find no such dichotomy. That is, Lenny, as the central personality, the full self, the full ego, that is, he participates in both the worlds. For example, we will find, you will find that it is Lenny who initiates the sexual encounter with Ruth. And even after Joey takes over the active role, Lenny remains in contact with them. He caresses Ruth's hair as his younger brother, the active physical self, embraces her. While Teddy, the contemplative intellectual part of the self, he stands apart and watches. <clears throat> it is again Lenny, himself curious and intellectual, who for a few moments earlier has been posing theological and philosophical questions. He has been asking these philosophical questions to Teddy. For example, I will quote it on the screen. So if you can just follow the conversation over here that they are making, uh, Lenny and Teddy, the conversation between Lenny and Teddy. The philosophical question that Lenny is posing, it proves that he is not just that. He does not only represent that brutish, passionate side that Joey is so full of. He is also constitutive of Teddy's self, the intellectual and philosophical self. But Teddy rejects both these inquiries. Teddy rejects all of these inquiries that Lenny makes. Intellect cannot resolve the problems of the existence of God or even certify the reality of the observed world. Intellect cannot do either. And remember that the absurdist school of drama has perpetuated itself on this foundation that the world has lost indeed lost all meanings and it is all chaos as a result even intellect cannot find the answer to these inquiries from the inability to of of the intellect to solve such central questions of human existence of human life it stem there stems or there is there takes a birth of the hostility of the hostility of the hostile nature which lenny shows toward Teddy, Teddy who has withdrawn to a separate world of the mind, of the intellect, that is the United States in the play, in his academic world. Or at any rate, Teddy is, as I have said, we mentioned before, he is dissociated from the lusts, from the passions in which Lenny has remained immersed. This hostility which Lenny, this hostility which Lenny shows towards Teddy, is most explicitly or starkly seen in the speech in which he rebukes Teddy, he rejects Teddy, who has retaliated you know, who has retaliated for the seduction of his wife by stealing Lenny's cheese roll. So that is what Teddy is doing, you know, Teddy retaliates uh, his 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 degree of passion is limited to that the fact that his wife is being seduced his passionate existence is limited to the fact that he steals out of spite he steals Lenny's cheese roll and then he says and I'm just quoting you can listen to it Teddy says it's funny because I'd have thought Just a moment. Yes. So this is what Lenny says. Lenny rebukes and rejects Teddy and says that it's funny because I'd have thought that in the United States of America, I mean with the sun and all that, the open spaces of the old campus. I have, uh, yes, I have quoted it on the screen and the entire dialogue. So we'll read it. Uh, so Teddy has stolen as i said teddy has stolen lenny's cheese roll and lenny says bare-faced audacity what led you to be so vindictive against your own brother i'm bowled over well ted i would say this is something approaching the naked truth isn't it it's a real cards on the table stunt i mean we're in the land of no holes barred now no holes are barred uh, symbolically in the relationship between the woman and all of these men around her 
Well, how else can you interpret it? To pinch your younger brother's specially made cheese roll when he's out doing a spot of work? That's not equivocal. It's unequivocal. So he's saying that that is not any equilibrium that you have reached by stealing my cheese roll. The fact that you are looking out for intellectual equilibrium, that is not doing uh, what you are, cheese, stealing my cheese roll is not doing what you just said. Uh, you are not being equivocal, you are being ambiguous in your nature. Mind you, I will say you do seem to have grown a bit sulky during the last six years, a bit sulky, a bit inner. A bit less forthcoming. It's funny because I'd have thought that in the United States of America, I mean with the sun and all that, the open spaces on the old campus in your position, lecturing in the center of all the intellectual life out there on the old campus, all the social world, all the stimulation of it, all, all your kids and all that to have fun with, down by the pool, the greyhound buses and all that, tons of iced water, all the comfort of those Bermuda shorts and all that on the old campus, etc., etc. He says, I'd have thought you'd have grown more forthcoming, not less. He continues, because I want you to know that you set a standard for us. Teddy, your family looks up to you, boy, and you know what it does? It does its best to follow the example you set because you're a great source of pride to us. That's why we were so glad to see you come back, to welcome you back to your birthplace. That's why. No, listen, Ted, he continues, there is no question that we live a less rich life here than you do over there. We live a closer life. We are busy, of course. Joe is busy with his boxing. I am busy with my occupation. Dad still plays a good game of poker and he does the cooking as well. Well up to his old standards and Uncle Sam is the best chauffeur in the firm. But nevertheless, we do make up a unit, Teddy, and you are an, you are an integral part of it. When we all sit around the backyard having a quiet gander at the night sky, there's always an empty chair standing in the circle, which is in fact yours. And so when you at length return to us, we do expect a bit of grace, a bit of je ne sais quoi, a bit of generosity of mind, a bit of liberality of spirit, not to reassure us. We do expect that. But do we get it? Have we got it? Is that what you have given us? So these are his complaints about Ted. Uh, the bit of French phrase that you read, it means some essential quality that, I've get, that cannot be put into words. So it is at par with all the uh, apparent uh, compliments that Lenny is giving to Teddy, that the fact that they look up to him. So uh, Lenny is not at all a brutish and just the physical part of existence. We can see that he has a bit of both. Now he is defending his side that there are no holes barred right now and at the same time he is posing certain existential questions to his brother as well. Uh, and he also admits over here that we are a unit. We form one single unit. Here Teddy's position and, the, and all of the paraphrased nearly all of the achievements that he has acquired within the American life, they become instruments for suggesting the exact opposite of what he has acquired, that is emptiness and failure of the mind, which is completely withdrawn from passion, which is completely withdrawn to its clean and comfortable place on the old campus. Lenny has used this phrase more than once, the old campus. To the bitter and thoughtful Lenny, Teddy's pointless intellectualism and very shallow perception towards life and all feelings, their inadequate responses to the brutal life that is in real that it that it is in reality. So all his intellectual in equilibrium cannot really attain the equilibrium when it would have a face off with the brutalities of life, when it would have a face off with the reality outside of that old campus. That is what Teddy thinks, uh, sorry, Lenny thinks, and that is what exactly what he's saying to Teddy. He's triggered by, the, by his petty stealing of cheese roll, that is. But whereas Lenny's angers against his older brother are essentially interior ones, you know, directed against the failure of his own intellectual self, we can say that it is Lenny's own intellectual failure which has caused him to unleash these diatribes, these insults against his brother. So, whereas that is one side of truth, his angers against his father, 
that is max they are directed outward to toward a separate personality and one of a very different order you remember sartre's philosophy that there is always the self and the other there is always the self and the other that is not you so if lenny is internally disappointed at himself and teddy represents that disappointed self of lenny because they are a single unit as i have mentioned before then max if you remember he falls into a different group altogether i will shift to that part of whiteboard for you to see just a moment yes so max belongs to this second group the second self that is so lenny's disappointment showing of disappointment towards teddy is an internal disappointment because they belong to the to one self but lenny's disappointment towards max is a disappointment directed externally because as i have said as max belongs to a different group of self to the second self that is over here that i had written you can see on the screen the second self therefore lenny's you know attacks against max against max they are externally located they are ex located outside of his self <clears throat> for max for max that is lenny is the, the full self the full ego the center of a distinct character having the sides of both the passion physicality and the intellectual philosophical self for max lenny is the full ego self though both have in common the dominating hostility that is the central passion of human universe as portrayed in the play that hostility is the central passion of all you of all human beings as the play represents so if they have this quality in common they are opposite in nature the quality differs in nature and the quality differs in in its object that is so if lenny is subtle thoughtful max is coarse very out there blustering and passionate and from max's predominant you know emotional side comes his tendency to sudden extraordinary contradictions he lacks lenny's powers of discrimination he cannot max cannot discriminate he lacks that power which lenny has max does not distinguish between internal illusion and external reality like lenny can lenny can distinguish between the two he knows that you know he 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 knows that that which is inside that the passions do not cause your reality but they are related but the passions do not cause your reality just because you are passionate towards someone does not mean that he or she will be existing in your real life with a role that you want to so your passions can be misplaced your passions can be completely intellectual they can be completely physical they can be unproductive for the matter but the fact that you know that your internal passions do not regulate your external life lenny can distinguish that but max cannot almost without any pause of transition you no know, max leaps he jumps from an idealized vision of family happiness when he was saying uh, we have a dialogue Uh, i remember the boys came down in their pajamas all their hair shining and they knelt down at our feet jessie's and mine i tell you it was like christmas so from this he he shifts almost without any transition he he suddenly shifts to an image of domestic horror and says a crippled family three bastard sons a slut bitch of a wife Now, through sudden, through these very absolute sudden shifts, Pinter projects the contrast between the surface world of order and benignness, 
and the inner concealed psychological world of violence and aggression. Nowhere is the contrast between these worlds more strikingly shown than in Max's divided attitude towards his own wife, that is, Jesse. Max says, mind you, she wasn't such a bad woman. So just now he's calling her a slut bitch and then he says, mind you, she wasn't such a bad woman, even though it made me sick. Just to look at her rotten, stinking face, she wasn't such a bad bitch. So look at the contradictory reaction that he has towards his own wife. In abusing Jesse and later Ruth, Max is a, you know, what he's trying to do is he's, he's, he's trying to neg negate one aspect of that violent inner world, the brute power of sexual impulse. And so he says, according to him, Ruth will make animals of them all you know, because of the passions that she would invoke as if the passions are not controllable as if Max and all the men in the house are very easily seducible so she he tries to negate that internal violent self he has that he recognizes that all of us do but he does not want to accept it he becomes a family cook. He has continued these efforts and he reverses the role of the sex as, it, uh, as well. You know, he, he becomes sort of sexless, sexless woman, you know. Lenny even tells him that you are sexless. But ultimately, Max too is in a thrall to power. The will to truth, the will to power that is, that exists in all of us in several degrees. So Max, in spite of being sexless, in spite of being called that, in spite of being totally brute, and in spite of being incapable of distinguishing reality from passions, he is also in the thrall, he is also in the race for power. And towards the end of the play, he implores, he begs Ruth to kiss him. The only one, we are coming to the next character in the group, the second group, the second self, that is Sam. So the only one who is vehemently opposed or steadfastly opposed to Ruth staying in England is Sam. Sam says that it's all rubbish. He does not, he's not at, he does not condone what the other men in the house are saying. He's not supportive. He protests when Max says that Ruth remain in the house in London, in England that is. For example, when Max greets the newly arrived Teddy with, with a barely disguised challenge to physical combat, Sam extends to him the only sign of genuine affection in the play. That is the only time that we find an instance of genuine affection when Sam tells Teddy that is, he has been his mother's favorite and that he will offer him companionship if he will stay in England. A truly affectionate line in the play, the only one. This rapport is not surprising either, for Sam stands in somewhat the same relation to Max and Teddy as Teddy does to Lenny. The relationship between Teddy and Lenny equates the relationship between Max and his brother Sam. So the two set of brothers, they basically mirror each other. Okay. Sam suggests through his gentleness that fact that he is horrified at the sexual infidelities of Ruth and Jesse. So Jesse was also an infidel. His occupation as a chauffeur, one who controls movement, that is, one who drives, he embodies at least some elements of a guiding moral impulse. Some elements. However, he is unsuccessful. However, he is inefficacious, he is ineffective, that is. But he 
injects certain moral axes within the play but that moral axis is maybe not required or not wanted or uh, doomed to fail at the end and that is why he quote unquote drops dead in between the play and nobody cares nobody really spares two seconds for this moral axis so sam displays open hostility only once only once when he speaks to his brother about their old family friend mac and he says old mac died a few years ago didn't he isn't he dead he was a lousy stinking rotten loud mouth a bastard uncouth scolding runt mind you he was a good friend of yours this is what he says to max but sam's anger is comprehensible it is understandable for mac is his complete antithesis max's unrestrained physical sexual self so if max is a bit restrained mac is entirely opposite to it and sam you know standing in the middle standing in the middle he is and finds in antithesis to stands in antithesis to both of these characters but more to him because mac is because mac is the extreme opposite of max so that which max was incapable of mac is capable of so of course sam is much more hostile towards mac than he is hostile towards max because at 70 70 years old max has lost or apparently lost his youthful strength and sexual capacity mac does not appear on stage and is presumed to be dead said to be dead but he survives in max's reminiscences look at how max remembers nostalgically mac that part of his self which he could no longer be that outright brutish sexual physical self so because max is already 70 and he cannot even attempt to regain that that niche that's that part of itself so we have an absent mac but we have the nostalgia we have the memory of that part of the self so i will put it on the screen so <clears throat> look at what uh, max says how he uh, remembers mac or mac gregor he says i used to knock about with a man called mac gregor i called him mac we were two of the most worst hated men in the west end of london I tell you I still got the scars we'd walk into a plate into a place i'm sorry the whole room stand up they'd make way to let us pass you never heard such silence mind you he was a big man he was over 6 foot tall his family were all macgregors they came all the way from aberdeen but he was the only one they called mac so to max fondly remembering his own strength the fact that mac was a big man over 6 foot tall but to sam the seducer of the respected and admired jesse was an uncouth sodding runt that is that is how sam defines mac and this is how what you see on the screen this is how max defines the same person mac or mac gregor yet this attempt to diminish mac in size and thus significance that is <clears throat> is contradicted at a climactic moment in the play at a very important moment in the play as ruth is in the act of agreeing to stay with the family and support herself by working as a prostitute sam comes forward gasps says and says my gregor had jesse in the back of my cab as i drove them along and collapses this is what he says before he collapses so through this extraordinary symbolic image of a moral self you know helplessly observing the sensual the passionate the physical self debasing an idealized figure that is jesse jesse is the idealized woman the figure the idealized figure over here pinter affirms the inability of the moral self 
to enforce its demand for order and restraint just had he just as he had asserted that the intel that the intellect is incapable of doing the same thing as well the intellect and the moral self they are both incapable of injecting order or structure into this chaotic violent reality of life moreover by placing sam's revelation about jesse the fact that he reveals this that mac had seduced jesse so this by placing sam's revelation about jesse at the point of ruth's final commitment to the family pinter reinforces the con the conception of jesse and ruth as parallel wife mother prostitute figures let us see how he does that now talking about the women in the play the range of reactions which these feminine figures in evoke is in addition suggested with with theatrical effectiveness which is very uh, successful you know, through the very division of the male figures into separate entities you know, to mac to macgregor as we have seen jesse appears to have been no more than an object of sexual gratification to sam on the other hand the even after the fact that he knew that jesse also participated in that infidelity to sam there was nothing wrong about jesse she was the best that there was a charming woman but to max who represents both of these men's selves max is the fuller self over here the brutality the physicality of macgregor and the morality of sam max represents both of these aspects and therefore to max jesse is just now a woman with will of iron of a heart of gold and and then again all of a sudden she is a slut bitch of a wife these are what she he actually calls her but even more strikingly opposite reactions are provoked by ruth who recreating jessie's role in the next generation suggests that its ambiguity is a permanent aspect of the human condition what jessie did hiding from others ruth is doing exactly in the gaze of her husband so what she is trying to prove the point that she is trying to prove or she stands as a symbol of proof of the point that all of these internal ambiguities that is which that which was in jessie's heart opposite to what she was among her family Ruth proves that these ambiguities are as much real and tangible and affective in nature. <clears throat> They are permanent aspect of the human condition. Even Joy, who calls Ruth a tart, I quote, and I, I, she calls, he calls Ruth a tart. So even Joy, who calls Ruth a tart, when he sees Lenny kissing her, and who seems at first only an echo of the course of that brute macgregor even joy does even he does not view you know ruth uh, through a, uh, through a all and all sexual lens he does not view her entirely in sexual terms although joy spends two hours upstairs with ruth without fully consummating a sexual union he is still devoted to and jealous for her jealous of her he says and i am quoting <clears throat> sometimes sometimes he says you can be happy and do not go to the whole hog so even joy who represents that 
perfect brutish physical physical self part of that self even he is satisfied by not going the whole hog that is not carrying out a sexual intercourse symbolically telling us that maybe he does not view rude in entirely sexual terms joy's rejection of the animal term the fact that you do not have to go to the whole hog his rejection of this animal turn and his position at the end of the play kneeling before ruth with his head in her lap as she strokes and caresses his hair it implies that to him she is both mistress and the mother so ruth is both the mistress and the mother to joy who is the complete who is the brute physical okay sexual physical self through this image pinter suggests that respect reverence and affection granted by the mother granted by the mother can never be dissociated from the lust aroused by the mistress so we come back to the freudian analogy we come back to that first desire of man the first lack created by his inability to acquire the mother as a sexual partner through growing up through social conventions the fact that is repressed so you can do a quick study of psychoanalysis so according to freud i think i have mentioned this in class so according to freud you know the or according to freudian interpretations freudian analysis freudian psychoanalysis the first desire even if it is not freud according to psychoanalysis the first desire is that of the mother that the man that the boy wants the mother uh, first and when he realizes that it is not feasible it is not socially accepted he shifts his attention to other women or to other sexual partners so here pinter is suggesting that old belief that the reverence and affection granted to the mother can never be dissociated from the lust aroused by the mistress for teddy on the other hand ruth plays the more compatible roles of wife and mother I'm sorry. Oh. So she is both she is the wife and the mother to Teddy rather than the mother and the mistress that she was to Joey. As Teddy says, she is a great help to me over there. He says enthusiastically, she is wonderful wife and mother. She is a very popular woman. She's got lots of friends. We've got a lovely house, etc., etc. but after a pause after that pink pinter's pause his enthusiasm it trickles down it snuffs down and he says my department is highly successful so he resents he resents and again to that dissociated academic intellectual self of his taking himself back from his passionate association with his wife with teddy in america ruth has been limited to these roles but in england before her marriage she had been a prostitute that is a woman seen almost entirely as a sexual being 
Despite its sadness, the tone of nostalgia in her words, as she tells Lenny of revisiting the house where she had been a model for the body, helps and prefigure or helps situate her rejection of Teddy's world and her acceptance of Lenny's. Ruth says, as she remembers the house where she had been, the body of the a body a model of the body, she says that there were lights on. I stood in the drive. The house was very light. That is, she was seen over there and she loved, she liked to be seen. But with Teddy, she was limited to roles which did not make her, make her visible to others. So here in this house, in Max and Lenny's and Joey's house and also Teddy's house, she finds herself again. In this world, she is to continue to function as a mother-wife and do a bit of cooking, make the beds, I'm quoting from the text, scrub the place out a bit, keep everyone company. But here, through her role as a prostitute, she would also resume the sexual identity that she has lost, that she had lost during her life with Teddy in America. For that identity, is inseparable from the violence and aggression of her adopted family. She has to acquire that identity if she has to become a part of this family, a family which is represented by hostility, by aggression, by passive aggressiveness, by vitality, by sexual passion, by physical passion, by brute force of violence. In this family, she cannot be a part of if she retains her role just as a caretaker, as a bed maker, as a cook, as a cleaning woman, as a mother. If I am to assume those roles of a mother, very shallowly put. She cannot do just those. She has to attain that previous identity of hers, which she also misses. So it's not that every, anybody is forcing or coercing her. We must remember that all the time. So she misses that. She's nostalgic of her past life. That past life which she had lost while she was married to Teddy and while she was living in America. Indeed, Lenny's first sexual advances to Ruth are accompanied by the elaborate stories of his beating two women. Remember how Lenny introduces himself to Ruth, his first sexual advances towards Ruth. What were they? Sorry, do you mind if I hold your hand? Just a touch, just a tickle. This stands wholly in contradiction to the fact that he had beaten two women. Moreover, the stories are particularly threatening since the women embody the roles of prostitute and wife mother that Ruth is to assume. In the first story, in the first story that Lenny that we are told about Lenny's past, that is. In the first story, when a woman falling apart with the pox pursues Lenny and begins taking liberties with him, he knocks her down and contemplates killing her. In the second, an old woman asked, asks him to move an iron mangle that has been left in her front room. Unable to do so, Lenny becomes angry and he says that he had a right mind. He had In his mind, he was thinking of hitting her. But far from frightening Ruth, these stories arouse her. 
for the world of violence and aggression is also the world of sexual vitality. She quickly dominates Lenny. The maternal power is closely linked to the sexual and she addresses him as Leonard. The name by which only his mother used to address him. When he attempts to reassert himself by taking her glass, Ruth says, if you take the glass, I will take you. She is flirting with him, of course. Soon she makes the glass a symbol of her feminine sexuality and <clears throat> combining her erotic and maternal power, she invites him to have a sip. She says, have a sip, go on. Have a sip from my glass, sit on my lap, take a long, cool sip. The arousal of her previously dormant sexuality through Lenny's aggression has given Ruth a profound sort of a satisfaction. She laughs, drinks from her glass and says, oh, I was thirsty. So she was, she's craving this sexual passion and vitality, which is which in this house and which by painter is equated to violence and brutality and aggression as well that sort of a physical and lustful passionate relationship that is what painter is talking about over here and ruth is aroused by that the arousal and satisfaction of ruth's thirst is one of the central actions in the play though the homecoming of the title is initially Teddy's, it ultimately and ironically becomes Ruth's, as I was saying uh, in our class together. Teddy cannot endure his family's world and he must return to America, but in Ruth, the thirst for passionate life, for sexuality, for violence, having been aroused, can only be assuaged and met if she stays over there with that family world, which is made out of just these things. Ruth's ultimate commitment is most dramatically suggested by her public embrace of Joey. But shortly before that act occurs, the symbolic nature of her choice between England and America is explicitly stated. Lenny taunts Teddy with theological and philosophical problems Ruth suddenly interrupts and says this. Don't be too sure, she says. You've forgotten something. Look at me. I move my leg. That's all it is. But I wear underwear, which moves with me. It captures your attention. My lips move. Why don't you restrict your observation to that? Perhaps the fact that they move is more significant than the words which come through them. You must bear that possibility in mind. So she interrupts them, them uh, by saying this. And she breaks off the intellectual conflict by suddenly calling attention to her sexuality. The room becomes silent. And Ruth continues, and I'm quoting, I was born quite near here. Then six years ago, I went to America. It's all rock and sand. It stretches so far everywhere you look. And there's lots of insects there. And there's lots of insects there. She repeats herself. So that's all America is about to her, insects. And then... She says, when she then, and now when we go back to that dialogue, Oh, I was thirsty, which Ruth utters after her proposal to Lenny is apparent. The comfortable America in which Ruth is only a wife and mother to her dry and sterile state of life, a desert, a wasteland where insects and not human beings live. For Teddy, however, America is different. It is clean for him. Clean of this immoral debilitations. 
of these unethical endeavors, of this non-intellectual, brute and physical life. That is why he loves America. And that is precisely why Ruth hates America. But a moment later, Teddy says, to Ruth, we can bathe in a, we can bathe till October, you know that. Here there is nowhere to bathe except the swimming bath down the road. You know what it's like? It's like a urinal, a filthy urinal. So if America, the life of intellect and restraint is to Ruth a desert of rock and insects, England, the life of sexuality and violent intensity, is to Teddy a filthy urinal. On one hand, Teddy cannot endure the aggression and unrestrained emotions of his family's world. And on the other hand, Ruth cannot sustain or subsist without them. The ironic appropriateness of her choice then is made apparent in the final scene when we find that not only is she to resume her identity as a prostitute but that Lenny, the most active member of the household, is in fact a procurer. As the play moves swiftly to its conclusion, Max's protests of family affection and the formal politeness with which Ruth, Ruth and Lenny negotiate the terms of her employment form a harsh contrast with the reality of lust, greed and aggression that dominates the scene. A contrast reinforced by Ruth's name with its biblical evocation of the woman who remains with her adopted family out of faithfulness and love. So, just a quick digression in the Hebrew Bible, in the book of Ruth, she chooses to stay with her adopted family. She runs away from her, her home to escape a famine. Uh, but when she has the opportunity to come back, she does not. She chooses to lay, stay with her adopted family, which is which is biblically symbolic uh, of the fact that Jews are Jews by choice. You know, by they are Jews by choice. So over here again, with its biblical evocation of the woman who remains with her adopted family out of faithfulness and love, this is what the this is the image that is reinforced by Ruth. By the end of the play, Teddy is returning to America, that world of thought, comfort, propriety, in which he even has another nickname. Because at the end of the play, towards the end of the play, Ruth calls him Eddie. So he's a completely different person over there. You know, that separates him further from any involvement with his family. Family with a family world of violence and physicality and sexuality and aggression. Sam, the pathetically ineffective moral self, lies unconscious and Ruth, now embodying the full strength of the sexual impulse, sits in her chair. Lenny watches as Joey kneels at one side of her chair and their father at the other, still desperately desires. Max moans and sobs and finally cries, I am not an old man. Do you hear me? Kiss me. Though Max is sexless, he is still gripped by the power of which Ruth has come to be the dominant representative, the force not merely of sexuality but of all those blind, brutal, hostile impulses which sweeps aside the restraints of life, the ethical, the moral restraints of life and make 
their own fearful claims to be a part of any vital existence. So vitality is the object of desire for rule, not sustenance, not a comfortable proprietary life. This, all of this that I said, is more or less taken from the, an essay called A Clue to the Pinter Puzzle, The Triple Self, in the homecoming by Arthur Gans. Mostly from this essay, however, I have there are inputs of my own as well. So feel free to quote. Uh, just remember to give proper references. And uh, with that, I will end this lesson. If you have any questions, any problems, feel free to come to me. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.